Good morning, everybody. It's a great blessing for me to come to you today and bring you the good news of Jesus Christ, the message of Christ's rule over the earth and what he is bringing into this world by the love of the Father and also his love for each one of us. Thank you that you allow me to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today. Let us just pray together as we start our service. Father, thank you so much that we can gather on this Sunday and that we can gather around your good news, the gospel, the message of your love for humanity, the good news of the inauguration of your kingdom and your rule in this world. Humanity has for so many years desperately needed a leader that is not into leading just for himself, just to enrich himself, but that is there for the people and you are such a leader. Thank you that you've loved us and that you have the solution for the problems of the world, which is life. You can bring us life. You can heal people from their sin. You can bring forth who you are in each one of us. Thank you for that. Father, I thank you that as I preach today and I bring your good news to people, that I can do so with a Uh, with your spirit, your spirit of life, your spirit of goodness. Thank you, Lord, that I will preach a message today that accurately touches the hearts of every person that is listening. Amen and amen. As many of you know, Ilian and I, we are in Zambia at the moment. I'm sitting here at a guest house and I'm making this Sunday recording on the Saturday because tomorrow morning I will be preaching in a local church here, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to people and equipping people in the message of God's grace. So uh, we will definitely have a Zoom church meeting again for those of you that have joined in to the Zoom church meetings that we would normally have when I'm in South Africa. We will definitely have some of those again while I'm here in Zambia. We're going to try out the internet and hope that it is good. I would like to do that once I've settled in my uh, in my own home. So we're going to see how that's going to work, but that is for the future. As for now, we are doing the services the way we are doing it. We just upload it to YouTube, premiere it, and then watch it that way. Well, thank you again that I could serve you in that way, and I trust this message is going to bless you today. As I've prayed, you know, I'm sure you, uh, those of you that have slotted into the beginning of the service, you would have heard during that prayer that I was thanking the Lord for His rulership, because the world needs a ruler a leader that can lay down his life for his people, a person that uh, has enough, that is rich enough, that doesn't struggle with ego problems, that doesn't try to prove a point or any of those things, but a God or a leader that can lead his people with in humility, humbleness, that cares for the needs of the people, that knows what's wrong with humanity and that he can then provide what is needed for those people. And Jesus Christ is such a leader. The Bible says in Hebrews that he's separate from sinners. He's not like a normal human being. A normal human being, I'm talking about a normal mortal man, a person that's got ego problems, a person that needs to be right all the time, a person that uh, needs to think of himself and how to promote his own career in politics and those kind of things, keeping everybody happy. The other day I was listening to a video on why the oil price is what it is and why they don't just pump more oil and all those kind of things. And it's very complicated. And it's got a lot to do also with uh, just the love of money, politicians, governments and all those kind of things. At the end of the day, it's about loving money. That's, That's what it is all about. And when you look at all of that and you think of the laws of this world, and if the laws of this world can bring a solution, you have to come to the bottom line conclusion that no law can bring a true change because uh, that law needs human ability to keep to that law. That law needs human ability or a person that doesn't want to find shortcuts through the law, but that wants to obey that law and has the power to obey that law. Now, humans don't have that, and the law doesn't provide that. The laws of the government simply cannot provide the peace it promises. The only peace that can truly come to a human heart, and the only solution for the problems of this world, and I've preached it so many times, is that people stand under the rule of Jesus Christ, where God, through Jesus, rules in our lives, 
takes death out of us, takes the fruit of the flesh out of us, brings forth His life in us, and so we will have peace. Now, I do believe that in the, uh, while, while there are many people that don't stand under the rulership of Jesus Christ, there will be governments and laws and uh, police and all those kind of things, and let that be. I'm not against that at all. But what I'm saying is, is that true change is in Jesus. True peace is in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are not, if you go and read Romans 14 there, it doesn't just talk about uh, spiritual standing before God. I'm righteous before God. I've got peace that God is not going to destroy me. And I've got joy. I'm happy that I'm going to go to heaven. That is not what it talks about. That is not what it is all about. It is, if you read that, it's about people living in peace with one another. Paul goes as far as to say in Romans chapter 14 there that he wants people to know that you cannot just eat meat just the way you like it and then cause your brother to stumble. He says, listen, think of your brother. Think of what would be good for him. Uh, the kingdom of God is a manifestation of peace between brethren. It's a manifestation of peace between people. That is the fruit that the kingdom of God has. And I think we should understand that. That is what it will bring forth in our lives. It will bring forth peace and joy and uh, also a comfort between people. That is what it will do. It will definitely bring that forth. So we don't have to think that the kingdom of God is so poor that it cannot provide true peace between people. It can truly do that, and it does that. What we do is, if we're even living in a world where things aren't going our way, we behold the lamb that was slain, that is alive, Jesus, and the life that he brings Towards us. Now, I'm going to read from 1 Peter, and I truly want to encourage you today to listen to this message, listen to, the, to all of it. It will truly bless you. I'm going to talk about, and I know I've talked about this previously as well, we're going to go a little bit more into detail, and that is to be sober-minded, not to be intoxicated with the things of this world, but to be sober-minded about who we are, what we are, how God feels about us, what God has brought for us, and uh, that we will minister from that perspective. As I'm here in Zambia and I'm preaching the gospel amongst people here and we are busy building at the, at the mission station, we're very busy from the morning until evening every day, basically uh, Monday to Monday, that's the kind of a thing. Now on a Saturday we have a bit of a break and that's when I make my recordings and upload it and edit it. But um, as, we are, as I'm here and I'm ministering the gospel, you can look at what's happening in this area. You can look at the people that live in this very remote area here. Yes, Christianity is here. It's not that Christianity is not here. But the understanding of the gospel what the gospel truly is. There's a very shallow understanding amongst most people here. I'm not saying that people are bad people at all. I'm just saying that the the churches that that is in this area really need a, a revelation on the love and the kindness of God, as what many churches in the first world need. And as I am here, you look at this task that is in front of a person and what you want to do, and it might look as if it is too big. It might look as if, man, are you ever going to uh, really see some significant change amongst these people and so forth. Now, we are so, much, so many times task orientated. We want to see so many people that whatsoever, you know, but God has come and he has simply said, listen, Bertie, uh, and he's put in my heart the desire, go and preach, share the gospel. God, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, is the builder of the kingdom of God. It's not my job. It's not your job. We are simply living what God has put upon our hearts. We're sharing the truth. And as this truth is shared, we find that people believe and people's lives are born from this. And this is just how it is. I want to say to you, as I'm a preacher of the message of grace, as if I've been as I'm a person that has preached this message for since 1995, 96, I started to preach uh, the gospel of His grace. And after many, many years of preaching this, I can tell you this, there is not a day in my life where I don't have to live by faith. Living by faith simply means where you look at this world and you know that this world cannot provide the life that one needs to live forever. It is impossible. 
And I've said this to my son as well. I said to him, son, you must know one thing. There's not a day in your life where you will live in this world where you will not experience the mortality of this world, where this world lacks life and it cannot give life. But there will also not be a day in this world as a believer in Jesus Christ where you will not have a life that is born from the hope that there is in Jesus Christ. So we look at the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the truth of his resurrection, what that means, and that gives us sober thoughts. That gives us real, true thinking along the lines of God's thoughts as pertaining to the world. When we live in this world, we want to think soberly. We want to think clear thoughts. We want to have clarity in our mind about the future, about who we are, about who God is, and so forth. We also want clarity on how to live in this world. That clarity is found in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Should it be true that there has been a man that died, was buried, really, truly dead, and that was raised from the dead, never to die, and that he was raised up to, into the the clouds of heaven, if you want, I'm not talking about the clouds of the earth, into the clouds of glory, and there he is seated. And after he was seated there, he was seen by people like Paul, for instance. And through him, the Spirit was poured out, and signs, wonders, and miracles took place in people's lives. Uh, and that is a historic truth and a fact. We cannot just ignore that. That would not be sober thinking. That would be, uh, I mean, if, if one doesn't take that into consideration, if one doesn't take that into our thoughts in how our lives are lived every day, we are not thinking sober thoughts. It would be equivalent to be in a country where there's a dictator ruling the country and you uh, continuing as if there is no dictator or you live in a jail and you're continuing as, as if there is no jail or like somebody that might have cancer and you continue as if you don't have uh, any sickness or disease or whatever. It's like you're not thinking soberly, not thinking uh, along the lines of the fact that's truly on the table. We need to know as Christians that yes, we might live in the year 2022, we might have certain political things that's going on. We might have fuel prices that has skyrocketed. I mean, the, we're planting some maize um, at the property there on the, at the mission station, and I just went to buy fertilizer. Now, I didn't buy fertilizer for a few years, and then I went to buy fertilizer. My goodness, <laughs> the price of fertilizer is just through the roof. It's like I couldn't believe what my ears heard when I saw the price of the fertilizer. So everything is, is just like through the roof. You don't know what's going on. But you can look at all of that. But if we are not taking into consideration that there was a man who died, who was bodily raised never to die, that is now seated at the right hand of God, who is called the Christ, and we've got that his historic facts right there. We cannot say we think soberly without making that the center point of our thought. It is something that is so monumental. It is something that is so gigantic that we cannot think outside of that. We have to interpret in everything inside that parameter because that is something that is outside of the norm. It is greater than this world. It's a phenomena that has entered this world. It was prophesied about. It is something that has changed the, the course of time. It's changed the history of the world. It's something that we have to consider every day of our life. Now, that is what Paul is saying here. And I'm going to read from First. Oh, not Paul. This is what Peter is saying. I'm going to read from First Peter. It says here from uh, chapter 1 verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we find somebody that lives with his feet on the ground, Peter. He lives in a, 
a world that has got the normal politics, the normal rhetoric, the normal things that's going on in the world. He's, uh, he's, he's living, feeling this world on his skin. And he is saying, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope. So Christ is the hope of the world. And he is also then the hope of the church. We who have believed upon Jesus, we have now appropriated, made use of this hope. And he says here, he's given unto us new birth into a living hope. Now, when you look at this world, when you look at the things of this world, it's so easy to see how this can give birth to emotions and feelings and all those kind of things. But what he says here is that we have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So whatever death could come to this world, Jesus was raised up out of that death. And as he was raised up out of that death, and he now rules, he's given us a new life, because we have hope now. I want you to think of somebody that's maybe out on the ocean and he's fallen off a ship or whatever and he's floating on a piece of polystyrene in the middle of the ocean and he's lost hope. He is now being overwhelmed by the waves, he's being overwhelmed by the situation. Maybe there's not even waves, it can be flat, it's just the sun beating down on him. He doesn't have fresh water, he doesn't have food, he knows he's going to die in a few days. If a shark doesn't eat him, he might last three or four days. And as he's losing hope, he has no hope, he then sees or hears a helicopter, uh, a search and rescue team flying towards him. As he hears that engine, as he hears the blades of that helicopter, you'll find that he has now be, he has been given a life, a new life that is born from that hope. So, when we look at the world up until the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or let me put it up until that, all the time before that, you find that they simply lived in the hope of Who's the next Caesar going to be? What army is going to deliver us? What freedom are we going to have? All of their life was simply based on how people lived in the world and what was going on in the world. That is, that is it. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, there was all of a sudden a new hope. Here we find there's a hope unto eternal life. There is someone that's gotten it right to conquer the death of this world, to conquer the decay of this world, to conquer, uh, in Afrikaans we would say, achteruitgang. What would we say in English for that? <laughs> yeah, is it regression? Yeah, something like that. Is things going backward all the time. The slow death that there is in this world. There's somebody who has conquered that. And all of a sudden, there is now hope. There is the sound of, not a helicopter engine, but the sound of eternal life that has entered this mortal world. And this is what Paul is saying here. He says, praise be to the God and the Father of Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter, is so, Peter goes as far as to say that this hope that has come through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what happens in a person's life when you believe that is a new birth. We have a life that's now born from what is eternal. There's an eternal man seated at the right hand of God who rules over humanity as someone that doesn't have an ego problem, that doesn't have a sin problem, doesn't have to prove a point, none of those kind of things, that wants to bring life to his people, who has poured out the spirit of life on people, and he has proven uh, the, his rule through signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, 
I want to say this and I want to encourage you. The scripture says clearly in Mark chapter 6, 16, it says that these signs will follow them that believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And those miracles then serve as a proof to the resurrection of Jesus. And I was just thinking it good as I was preparing for this message to during the message say to you, if any miracle has taken place in your life, be it a healing, whatever it is, please write it in the comments. Just say, listen, I've been healed of this. God has done this for me. Because those signs, wonders and miracles serve as signs that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I was reading on uh, Facebook somebody that asked the question, has, have you ever received a miracle? And if you have, write it in the comments. And people started to write. And I think there was 135 comments a lot of people just said many miracles. I encourage you not to write many, but just to write what has happened to you. Even if you've, God has healed you from a sore knee or whatever it is, as you write that down and people read it, as I was reading through those comments, what it was saying to me is Jesus was raised. Jesus was raised. Jesus was raised. Look at his rule in these people's lives. He has shown that he has power over mortality and he has brought signs that he can rule and bring eternal life to the human body by bringing these miracles. You don't have to have a miracle every time you pray in order for this to be true. Even if there's just one miracle, that one miracle, you have to answer the question, who has done it? Why is it there? What does it mean? Every miracle means something. It means that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now, with that said, I want to just remind you that the life that we have now is from this living hope. So there is someone that's alive, Jesus, and we have a new life that is born from this hope. As we realize what the resurrection is all about, we you'll realize that it gives you a brand new life. Okay, now I want to read from um, ver the end of verse, or let me read from verse 8. It says here, Though you have not seen Jesus, you loved him. And even though you have not seen him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So what Peter is saying here, and this is exactly what we have, we need to understand that we have great faith. It's basically impossible to live in the year 2022, believe that Jesus died, rose again, that he is Lord, and that he rules over our lives, and that we have the hope of eternal life, and that not be great faith. Remember, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. Here Peter says that you love him though you've never even seen him. He goes on to say you are even filled with inexpressible joy. And you, you have not seen him, meaning you've, you have never met Jesus. And you believe that he existed. Then you believe that he was raised from the dead. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And you have not seen this man. But you still believe in him. And you have now the fruit of that belief, which is inexpressible joy. Meaning you are now starting to experience the life that comes from Christ. Now, if they back then, if, if Peter kind of marveled uh, over these people's faith, what would he have said about us? What would he said about, have said about us who 2,000 years later have exactly the same and still believe and we are spreading the gospel, we are preaching the gospel? Would that be seen as little faith, people that are... No, we shouldn't judge ourselves as just those of little faith. We should see what God is doing in us. We shouldn't discredit what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, 2,000 years after he died and rose from the dead, I tell you, it's a miracle. It is a miracle. It's not a miracle in the sense of uh, you are stupid and you're just believing it. No, it talks about the fact that you can believe today and the fact that you can have joy today talks about the authenticity 
of what we believe and it also talks about the faith that we that God has brought forth in our heart it's not a small thing it is something that comes from God and is poured out in our hearts glory to God now it says here let me read it again though you have not seen him you have loved him and though you have not seen him now you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible glorious joy for you are receiving present continuous tense the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul or the salvation of your life. Your life is being kept safe. So the joy that you have as you believe in Jesus Christ is the salvation of your life. Your life is not being pressed in upon, taken from you. It is preserved by the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go to verse 13. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that is to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. So, knowing this, and we have our minds on this, listen to what Peter says, Therefore, with minds that are fully alert and sober, a fully alert and sober mind is a mind that is mindful of Jesus. Not a mind that is mindful of our shortcomings and what we need to do in order for God to bless us or something like that. Not a mind that is mindful of the broken world and how it, you know, how it doesn't give hope and how we are now sad about that. No, a sober mind is a mind that is fully alert and fully hoping in the grace that is to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So a sober mind, a sober life is a mind and a life that is born from the hope that there is in Jesus Christ, which is the grace that is to be brought to us at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we live under grace right now, but there's still a grace that is to be brought to us. I want to encourage you, church. Uh, we cannot live a life in this world and think that we are thinking soberly. You want to see how much time I've got left there. We cannot live in this world and think that we are living soberly in this world. And we are not considering the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and His influence in this world. We cannot say we think soberly when we think of world events what's going on in the world, wars, rumors of wars, without truly thinking, pondering, and bringing into the equation the death, burial, and resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The proof, the evidence, signs, wonders, and miracles. Please write down your miracle in the comments that God has done for you. People need to hear that. As you read that, you can know God has done a miracle for that person. That means Jesus was raised from the dead. If you have a miracle, you write it down. If you just read miracles or what God has done for other people, you just write it down. Uh, or or as, as you read that, you'll be encouraged by that. No, every time you hear about a miracle, it is a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's like a sign. I want to just say this. You don't have to have the sign all the time. Uh, you don't have every one meter a sign next to the road telling you the distance to the next town. Uh, you only have it every now and then, and it shows you you are on the way. That is what signs, wonders, and miracles are, are about. It's pointing to the resurrection. We cannot, as we hear about miracles, as we hear about signs and wonders, as we can testify on how God has supernaturally provided for us, how He has brought miracles to our lives in our history or in that of other people's lives, having the historic event of Jesus Christ's resurrection, ascension, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We cannot say we think soberly if that is not making out a very, very large part of our reality, the foundation or the lens through which we interpret everything. I want to give you this example. Let's say you've got a contract, and that contract is a, a contract to, let's say, deliver soil. They are busy um, building a bridge now here crossing the river where we always had that pontoon. I think you've seen videos where Eliana and I were in the car and we went over this pontoon that they just pulled by the hand to cross the river here. Um, they are taking that away. They're building a bridge. 
So that's going to just make things so much easier for us. I mean, it's very nice to go over that pontoon, but it's very expensive and it takes a lot of time. You cannot go any time. It's just like a bridge is just going to be so much better. Now, in order to build that bridge, they need all the gravel and all those kind of things. So at the guest house where we are staying now, there are also some Chinese people here and they've come with the big machines and whatever. They're b busy getting all the gravel together. Now, let's say they've got this contract. They must deliver the gravel and they m must have that ready by, let's say, end of January. And end of January, the contract expires. Now, that's wonderful, you know, and they can be busy. But let's say end of January comes and it's February. Do you think that they're going to read that contract and say, look at all the wonderful things that's written here. We are still, and we're going to get money. We continue to bring gravel. No, they're going to stop to bring the gravel. Why? Because of one sentence there. And that is, this contract expires on 31st of January, 2023. That is a very important part of that contract the very same way with the world we can have everything that's going on in the world but then we only need one sentence that ends everything and that is and jesus was raised from the dead he was raised from the dead not as what lazarus was but raised never to die he ascended into the clouds of heaven where he rules as the I can let's put it this way, the president or the king over those who believe upon him, bringing in the kingdom of God into this world. That brings tremendous hope. That gives birth to a brand new life. Amen. We need to understand that the grace of God teaches us to live sober lives in this world. The grace of God to, that is to be brought to us at the last day is the resurrection and what peter is saying is that we as christians who live as christians who've got the hope of the resurrection that is the grace that is to be brought to us at the last day and this grace the power of the resurrection teaches us how to live soberly in this world you know if i if you sit over here in western zambia or wherever you are preaching the gospel uh, it can be a remote place, it can be in the inner city, it can wherever you, you can be. You can look at that and you can think, well, soberly thinking, you know, wh what am I doing? Well, soberly thinking, you know exactly what you are doing. You are standing under the rule that will never end, the rule of life, the rule of the kindness and the goodness of God, which brings life to all people. And His Spirit is bringing forth fruit in you to maybe share the gospel or whatever good is born from that, a life that's born from that, to those people. You might be a supporter of a church or a ministry, people that are supporting Dynamic Love Ministries, and you can think soberly, what am I doing in supporting this ministry? What you're doing is this. You are experiencing the life of God living inside you and you've got sober thoughts. There was a man raised from the dead, Jesus. He is my Lord. His kingdom is manifesting in this earth. And sober thoughts about this is to have your life open to the rule of this man, Jesus, who is God and is ruling in your life with who he is and you are sharing in the eternal life that will never end. If you think of South Africa and the ending of apartheid, you can never think of history in South Africa without thinking of the uh, new constitution and Nelson Mandela because when that came, it changed everything. It changed everything. And now, if you've got sober thoughts about the politics in South Africa, you have to align your life or you will see that your li life is aligned if you are in your right mind with the new laws, the anti-apartheid laws. It changes the words that you can say, certain words you cannot say, certain things that would be hate speech and so forth. And your life is changed by that event. How much more, how much more uh, the resurrection of Christ. Do you know apartheid can be reversed? Many people complain about that. No, we are just under reversed apartheid now or whatever it is. 
It can, it can be reversed and, and it can come in in its evil way, whatever. But you know that the resurrection of Jesus, his eternal life can never be reversed. It can never be. It can never not be true. And that is how we think. That is the foundation from where we think. That's the foundation from where we reason when we look at what's going on in this world. Hallelujah. The scripture goes on to say, it says here, um, it says, for you know, it's, it, he basically encourages the people, he's writing to Gentiles, he says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with precious blood of Christ the Lamb without blemish or defect. He has chosen he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope is now in God. So he says, listen, I don't want you to go back to the old things, the old perishable things, the things where, you're, where you've served idols and those kind of things. Your life, your life was not redeemed with silver and gold and all those kind of things. Now, what he's talking about here is the worshipping of idols. If we mention it in today, a lot of us are not worshipping idols as what they were. Uh, but we can still say that our lives are not redeemed by things like silver or gold or money or any of those kind of things. We, those are not the things that brought us peace. What brought us peace is Jesus Christ. I want to just add this thing in there. By that I'm not saying that Christians are... Uh, supposed to be poor. I don't think Jesus Christ was poor. Jesus was definitely not poor. Imagine you having 12 disciples and you feed them every day. And obviously, if you've taken those people out of their workplace where they were fishing and all those kind of things and they do have family, do you think that Jesus would not have provided for Peter, for the disciples, Matthew, and all those people who's got families, who's got uh, wives and children, and now say, I'm taking the one that is working and providing for the, for the children and for the wife. I'm taking him away and I'm not giving him anything. No, Jesus would provide for all his disciples. When they would travel, yes, sometimes they would sleep under a tree and in, outside of town in a bush. Sometimes I'm sure they would book in some place and Jesus would pay all of that. Uh, I remember when Jesus, if I read that piece where Jesus was uh, asked to multiply or he asked disciples to, you know, what they're going to do about this 5,000 people that don't have bread. And they said, well, uh, where are we going to find so much bread now? Because they were willing to go and buy it. Now imagine you have enough money on you to go and buy bread for 5,000 men. Let's double that. Let's say... Women and children all together was 10,000. Who of you have got enough money on you to just go and buy bread for 10,000 people? So I just want to say this. When I talk about our lives are not redeemed by silver and gold and all those kind of things, I'm not saying that a person, you know, we as Christians must be afraid of having any finances or anything like that. I'm not think, I don't think Jesus was a poor man. I don't think he was what we would call the prosperity preachers of this day where he was going around, flashing around money and finding his identity in money. But you cannot travel with 12 people, you know, around you. And he, he, there was a time when he had much more disciples. You know, and he would care for those people. He would be good. He would give even to the poor. So it was definitely the case that Jesus did have to have finances. It is just the way it is. So please know I'm not knocking uh, prosperity here or financial prosperity I do believe that uh, it is it is there and that there are people that can have a lot of money that are Christians it's not a sin to have money to, and be a Christian neither would I say that if you're a Christian um, and you don't have a lot of money that you can say well I cannot be content I cannot be happy I cannot be joyful because the scripture says here our lives were not redeemed by silver or gold or any of those kind of things but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who died and who was raised from the dead um, and then giving us the hope that we now find in God our hope is not anymore in the things of this world but in God.
Glory to God. Man, I've got to end this service. Um, I just want to say to you, the message that I have for you is simple. I want to encourage you. Know that we have a new life by the hope that there is in Jesus Christ. You can never think soberly without thinking of the grace that is to be brought to you in the last day, which is the resurrection. In other words, any conclusion you jump to or come to about your life and your future and that of your children outside of seriously considering the death, burial, resurrection, ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit where signs and wonders was the proof of his resurrection, if you don't consider that as a serious center point consideration, as what you would consider a date in a contract that says when the contract expires, if you cannot consider that, you have not thought sober thoughts. You're not thinking soberly about your life. You're not thinking soberly about the world. And if we look at the news media, if we look at what's going on in the world, we don't find sober thoughts. I've never seen uh, CNN or uh, a Fox News or South Africa, SABC, or I mean, all these different news channels. I've never seen them uh, considering the resurrection and the immortal man, Jesus Christ, as Lord of heaven and earth and what that means for the politics of the day and what that means for our lives and where that enjoys absolute center stage. I've seen some uh, Christian news stations which would mention the resurrection as well and then mention what's going on in the world but not from the perspective of this is the only truth and the hope wherein you always feel hope when you listen to what is said. But I want to tell you, if we're not thinking those thoughts, we are not simply not sober in our thought. May read verse 13 again. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. So what is our hope? It's the grace that is to be revealed at His coming. In the meantime, many things can happen to us, but that's not where our hope is. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love what this passage says. He says, from that hope, we have now a brand new life in this world. Glory to God. That is life-changing. That just gives such a, a sense of purpose, uh, that, that gives a person such a sense of hope. Uh, it puts your focus again on Jesus Christ. The Bible says, keep your eyes on Christ who is your life. Amen. Amen. Well, I've come to the end of the service and uh, thank you that you've allowed me to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ. Know that you are his child, man. He smiles over you. He, <laughs> the Bible says that he, the Father has given you to Jesus and you are in the hands of Jesus. And Jesus has got this commandment of the Father, and that is that He should raise you up in the last day. So your life is literally in the hands of Jesus and His ability to revive you and restore you to, to the fullness of of what God has intended for you. The Father is drawn on the strings of your heart. You've said yes, and you've been given to Jesus to preserve you. He's the preservative. He's preserving your life forever. You are safe in the hands of God. You can know that God has never failed any person. He has proven faithful through all of history. And even if you can say, oh, but here was an unanswered prayer here or there in someone's life, that is irrelevant in the light of the empty grave. It shouts so loud that it is deafening. It closes your ears to the sound of anything else because something that is greater, that's above all power, all authority, all rule, has now entered this world and we are under that. That is the truth about you. So this is not a, uh, a life anymore of sin consciousness. We have something that's greater than sin and that is the resurrection of Jesus. 
We are resurrection conscious and we are life conscious. We are his goodness conscious. We are his uh, power conscious and that gives victory for us. Hallelujah. That gives us sober thoughts. Do you think God has got sober thoughts about this world? Yes. And whatever he thinks is sober. Let us pray. Father, thank you that I can sit here today and I can stretch forth my hands to this phone. And in the spirit, I and by the power of the resurrection, I stretch it forth to every person that's watching. I thank you, Lord, that you touch their minds, their heart, their body. You bring healing, you bring understanding, you bring clarity of mind. Where clarity of mind is thinking about what you've done for us and what it brings. Thank you, Lord for your goodness and your kindness that is over us. I declare every person blessed. I declare them well spoken of. I declare them under the grace of your resurrection. I declare them under the power of the kingdom of your rule. Amen and amen. Thank you so much that you've watched this and that I could serve you today. We'll just have more messages coming in this week. Every week we have our daily devotionals and then next Sunday we'll have another message.